Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Agape Chicago. We are so glad that you're joining us this morning, whether you're here in person or you're on Facebook Live. We want to say Happy New Year. And if you're a guest with us this morning, we are hopeful that you'll leave here today knowing that we are serious about a God who is wise and that even his foolishness is wiser than the wisdom that we might acquire. Devils Connect with you, please fill out the information on the bulletin uh, with your contact information. We'd love to be in contact with you uh, so that we can find out what God is doing in your life and uh, perhaps you can find out what's going on at Agape Chicago and we can bring those two things together and uh, glorify God in all that we do. Also, take the time to put down your prayer requests. Our leadership team loves to go to the throne of grace to make petition on your behalf so that you and we might find mercy and grace in our time of need. So please, prayer requests are coveted. Uh, we do pay attention to them. We do spend time in prayer on your behalf. And if you believe God is a God that answers prayer, then please add your prayer request to your information. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, the bathrooms are located, men, right outside the door, and the women's washroom is down the hall to the left. Uh, feel free to take advantage of that uh, when it is necessary. We do like to train up the children in the way that they should go. However, this morning, we will not be having children's church. So uh, if your children are here, keep them quiet in the seat if you can, but we know children are children, and children do what children do. God bless them. The Lord loves the little children. A little bit in the way of announcements here. I just want to tell you a little bit uh, about our agape communities. Uh, right now, our agape communities, for the most part, are on hiatus, and we do not have any announcements, but we do have several agape communities that, that work and serve inside of our community. The Blue Sky Cathedral Agape Community operates on the streets of Rogers Park, mostly at Howard and Polina. We will be out this Thursday, 6 p.m., so if that's something that you're interested in, please contact me. I'd love to have you out there with us. Uh, we pass out hot chocolate and chips and gospels and tracts, and we pray for folks, and uh, it is really a, a God-fulfilling time is how I can describe that. God glorifying time. There's a women's prayer meeting that will be meeting at 6.30 on Zoom. Uh, you can contact Molly about that at hassettmb at gmail.com. Hassett, H-A-S-S-E-T-T-M-B at gmail.com. Agape Community Living Well serves the infirm at the nursing home. Uh, remind me of what that nursing home is called again? Waterford. The Waterford Nursing Home is 7445 North Sheridan. So uh, if that's something that you're interested in doing, please uh, contact Scott Martin about that. Works in Progress is an agape community that serves and targets entrepreneurs and artists. And so if you're interested in that and you have a skill that is artistic, please, that's something that you want to be in contact with. So go on and contact uh, Pastor Jeremiah at jeremiahvault at gmail.com. And finally, on our Agape communities, there's no returns. No returns serves refugees in our community. Again, to be determined what's going on with no returns over the next week. But if you're interested, you have a heart for people who feel out of place because they're from another place and you want to make a deposit of God into their lives so that when they go back to the place that they're from, somewhere on the other side of the world, you can say that you've made a deposit into their lives and you have sent the gospel around the world. For no returns, please contact Dallas Lukwago for that. Uh, Dallas Lukwago at gmail.com. Going to have a membership class. Looking for you to join our church. If, if this church is something that you want to make a deposit in for the kingdom of God, and you have found a comfort here that you are coming every week or every other week, and you consider this your church home, uh, membership class will take place on Sunday. Sunday, January 23rd at noon. The class will at least be available by Zoom. 
uh, possibly in person, but whether or not we'll have the option to meet in person, we'll decide as that time draws closer. Please, 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 please contact Ralph if you want to be a part of this church and become a member, and Ralph will tell you exactly what it is that you need to do in order to do that. We welcome you into our family. Uh, we love you and uh, we desire to get to know you and to grow closer and to all together glorify God with the things that we do. I want to call up the music team. The music team is going to lead us in verbal worship this morning and praising God. However bad you may sound, it is a delightful sound in his ear. And so we ask that you would lift your voices in song. I give you the music team. Good morning. Um, I chose some songs today that either focus on the start of the new year and creating a vision uh, for your own heart that's in line with the heart of God um, and trusting what he has in store for us at the beginning of this year. And then also one where the chorus is probably familiar, but the verses themselves may not be quite as familiar, but they do mention Abraham. And we're in that series right now. So I hope you enjoy these uh, first two songs. And then as we proceed through the service, just more that focuses our heart on what God intends for us in this year.
unto us, Lord God, that is wiser than any wisdom in this world. And we ask, Lord God, that you would open our hearts, that you would send your spirit, uh, that you would pierce us, Lord, and make us ready to receive what it is that you have for us today. We desire that, Lord, so that we can glorify your name in all that we do. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we say, Amen. We are coming out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 31, where the Bible says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent intelligence of the intelligence I will frustrate where is the wise person where is the teacher of the law where is the philosopher of this age has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world for since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe Jews demand signs Greeks look for wisdom but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Man does not live by bread alone. The man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Please be seated for the preaching of the word. First, let me make an announcement. Uh, beginning next week, uh, and even today we're doing a test run, but beginning in earnest next week, we are going to be doing live streaming on Facebook Live throughout the rest of January 9th, the 16th, the 23rd, and the 30th. I wanted to let you know that. And also, beginning next week, we are allowed to treat uh, this time to gather as a worship gathering instead of like a restaurant or a business like that. So we are permitted to meet without checking vaccination status. If you think you might have been exposed to COVID during the week, feel free during the next four services especially to avail yourself of the tests out front. That means today, uh, if you've been exposed, go somewhere else and stand in line, folks. I mean, I'm just... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we will have tests available next week if you are at all concerned that you may be, uh, may be in any danger of having COVID and bringing it into our, uh, our context. So I wanted to let you know that. Uh, before I get started, I do want to pray again. <clears throat> uh, Father, we come to you as people that need 
wisdom. We can say, be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. And we can say, we want to walk with you step by step. And today we're here walking with you step by step and asking you to lead us, in fact, into wisdom. And so when we get together like this, we ask that you would be the one that through your word does something in power through your spirit. So we do, we we come and ask. Move in our our midst, move in our presence, we pray. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. I hope many of you recently received some very nice Christmas gifts. I really do. I hope that for you. I'm I'm a nice pastor like that. And I think we can all agree that there are basically two types of Christmas gifts that are really nice to have. Those that we really want and we receive. And then secondly, those that we had no idea that we needed, but when we received them, we're like, yes, that's a great idea. When I was nine years old, I asked for tickets to the Peach Bowl, a football game for the university that I liked. The first type of gift. When I was dating my now wife, who is ever so practical, I received an electric toothbrush for Christmas. I didn't know I needed that, but it turns out that I did. The second (laughs) type of gift. Many of us Bible preachers, when we uh, come up here and stand before you, we focus on, on identifying things that you need. We show you what you lack and how Jesus provides it. We show that we should ask from the Lord forgiveness, righteousness, and life everlasting. And that approach is like the first gift, after all. I show you what you lack and then how Jesus provides. But our sermon scripture actually works more like the second gift. It tells us what Jesus has actually done, and then it helps you realize, aha, yeah, I really did need that. Specifically, we learn that the cross of Christ gives us something in particular. Today, we learn that Jesus' cross gives us true wisdom and genuine power for all times. <clears throat> but I want to focus our attention on how this wisdom and how this power relates to 2022. This is, after all, January 2nd. And I want to make sure that you feel that I'm giving you something for your year that's better Uh, than what you'll find on on pop sitcoms or pop television shows and the like. So I want to make sure you understand where my sermon is going. True wisdom and true power. And I want to help you see that along the way, I'm helping you live in 2022 with wisdom and power. So first, the cross gives us true wisdom. The cross gives us true wisdom. Now, the first sentence of our passage is one that I would love for everyone to memorize and marinate on and to hold fast throughout the entire year. This verse teaches with clarity how most people view the cross of Jesus differently than Christians. It reminds us that trusting in Jesus' cross isn't just hard for some, it seems completely silly. And this verse sets up the contrast between the true wisdom and foolishness of the world and also the true wisdom of God and the weakness contrast that shapes this entire passage. So read with me 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. Note that word cross is emphasized here. It's the cross in particular that's foolishness. And Paul makes that point before our passage and after the point. He hones in on the cross, not merely the execution of Jesus, not merely the death of Jesus, but the cross in particular. The means of our salvation, death by cross, is foolishness, ridiculous, absurd, folly to those who don't receive our Lord. And he wants you to understand that clearly. This doesn't make sense to a lot of people. No, not only does it not make sense, it seems ridiculous. And Paul will reiterate this again, that the foolishness of the cross is made apparent to the Gentiles in 1 Corinthians 123, and then also a stumbling block to the Jews. The cross of Christ is not merely hard, it's weird. Though Paul will help us see why the cross is the wisdom, though Paul will help us see why the cross is the wisdom of God, we need first to get our, our minds around why does Paul talk like this about the cross? Because we embrace it. People make signs of the cross. People wear it around their necks. Why does he talk about it as if it's foolishness in his context? 
Now, if you've heard me preach enough, you've heard me tell you that the idea that a crucified man was the Jewish Messiah or the Savior of the world wouldn't have simply been merely odd. It would have bordered on shameful. It would have bordered on shameful. Why? Because crucifixions were meant to embarrass. You have likely heard a great deal in sermons about the pain that someone endures when they go through the cross. Even our word excruciating from the Latin literally means from the cross. However, the New Testament authors don't highlight the suffering and pain of the cross as specific to the cross as much as they do the shame and the humiliation. The cross, painful as it was, was just as much an instrument of embarrassment and mockery. And that is connected to the point Paul is making about why it's powerful. Often done in public, crucifixions represented that a person was considered nothing to the Romans. They were a nobody. They were a loser. One couldn't even crucify a Roman citizen without Caesar's approval. It was often reserved for foreign enemies, for slaves, and for those that were non-citizens meant to embarrass their weakness and their lack of status. They would be executed naked and left for passers-by to mock them while they were suffering for an extended period of time. To Romans, to Gentiles, crucifixion is proof that you're a nobody and going to be treated like a nobody. And of course, the vultures and other animals there mocking them as well would contribute to the suffering and the like. The wise and the intelligent of that day, for example, uh, like Socrates, could not even be executed like this they were socrates for example as you know was poisoned uh because he uh, taught foreign gods supposedly he was treated like somebody he was able to be uh, uh he was able to be killed in privacy preaching a crucified messiah no matter how alive you say he is would have been ridiculed for paul to say in romans 1 16 i'm not ashamed of the gospel means that he had a reason to be ashamed and it was a shameful message for many of the Christians, at least to the hearers here, what are you talking about, they thought. On top of that, for Jewish people, preaching a crucified Messiah is foolishness because their laws taught that anyone executed on a tree must be cursed by God. So the idea that a Messiah, a king, a person of any worth or status at all, or any importance whatsoever in human history was crucified is foolishness. I want to make sure we understand that before we move along. The cross was folly to those who are perishing then in a way that's a little different than it is today because people still live as enemies of the cross of Christ, as the Apostle Paul makes clear in Philippians. Today, people mock the cross of Christ because they really don't understand it. You know, It sounds a little bit like maybe Greek mythology or pagan rites. Why does someone need blood atonement? To cover over our sins and those are the same sort those are the sorts of objections you might hear to the cross today whether or not it's the first century or the 21st century however we know that many people live and look at the cross as if it's folly and i want us to understand that to make sense of how paul can say that cross in particular is the wisdom of god to make sense of how Paul claims this foolishness is wisdom, we also need to understand something about the people that he's writing to, the church in Corinth. This city where these group of churches would have lived would have been almost like a second city of intelligence in academia. Uh, if you could imagine that Athens, Greece, were like your Harvard or Oxford, then Corinth is more like your Princeton or your Cambridge. You see, they're, they're very, very smart people. They're high in the philosophical and teaching guild, but they're not quite number one. And so there might have even been a little bit of a chip on their shoulder to prove just how intelligent they were after all. And that pressure to be part of the intelligentsia of the day would have been great on the church in Corinth. And these people that they were rubbing shoulders with, the ones that they knew had the philosophies of the day, would have been the ones with the PhDs beside their name, if you will, and saying that cross is just ridiculous. You, you, uh, there is a, there was a fresco discovered, uh, dated from the second century, outside, and it said this on it: "Alexa Manos is God," and had a picture of a crucified man with a donkey's head on it. That gives you a picture of what it was like for the intelligentsia of that day to view the cross. And so when they were dealing with this, uh, the people, when the Corinthians were dealing with this, they were probably having that same experience we have sometimes. Like, 
it seems like the, the great philosophers of our day don't really make much of the cross. They can kind of ridicule it. Now, for that reason, Paul directly addresses what the Corinthians are experiencing in 1 Corinthians 1, 19 through 20. He says this, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? I want to latch on to that last idea that God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. How did God use the cross of Christ, is my question, which is foolishness of the world, to actually undo that wisdom? Part of the answer is in understanding both the wise person and philosopher piece of what I just mentioned. In the Roman world, especially after, say, Aristotle, there was a latent belief that we, through our rationality, through our minds, could figure out enough from our observation and our intelligence to make sense of divine realities. We could take our rational minds, observe things, especially if you were elite, and know something about how things operated. Christians today even still use variations of an argument made by Aristotle in that day called the cosmological argument to defend the existence of God. Because we, like him, say there cannot have been an infinite regress of cause and effect, so there must have been some unmoved mover originally. And we still say things like this because of Aristotle. And Aristotle and other people like him said, guess what? This we can understand through our rational minds. We can perceive enough to tell you what's really going on if you're smart, if you're elite, like us. Mm. Now, this trust in human intellect might leave us with rational arguments for the divine, but Paul would suggest that human rationality is so biased, even though quite good because we are image bearers of God, through our intellects we cannot gain the wisdom we need to know who God is. Why? Because while given the capacities to perceive something of divine realities, our hearts and thus our minds are incredibly biased, and we are blind to the light. Our, sign, our senses often prove what our hearts desire. We, we make sense of the world in ways that we like. Uh, hasn't the whole pandemic actually been a major exercise in like showing, hey, this is how you read the world, and you're going to find information that lines up with that? especially our confused neighbors. Ha, 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 ha. You know what I'm saying? Like we, we recognize the truth of what Paul is saying, that there's a limit to human rationality and all of that. But what has that to do with the point? The point is this. Paul is claiming human wisdom is incapable of reaching and attaining the truth about God. It cannot do it. We need something else. We need intervention. In fact, God, by placing under us under a curse, as we learned elsewhere, leaves us unable to know God without help. You cannot know God by your observation and rationality alone. You need revelation. And so that helps us understand what he says next in 1 Corinthians 121. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased to the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. And what is this foolishness that saves us? Why, again, it's the cross of Christ. And what has this to do with wisdom? The cross proves that not only can we not know God without intervention, we cannot even save ourselves. We cannot have access to God. We cannot have friendship with God without God coming down and intervening on our behalf. Without this foolish message of the cross, aka, uh, excuse me, without the foolish message of the cross, what he calls foolishness, which is God's wisdom, we cannot perceive our need for God rightly. The cross proves once and for all, guess what? You're not going to save yourself. Now, I want to make sure we understand what I'm saying here. Faith alone saves us. But it's not simply faith in a cross that does nothing that saves us. There's something real about the cross that saves and Paul elsewhere teaches that, in fact, at the cross, Jesus does cleanse our guilt and take on our punishment for sin and the wickedness that we lived. But to the point today, the cross is the place where humanity's wisdom is revealed as fundamentally broken. Mm. As a human race, we thought it was a good idea to crucify God the Son. 
the wisdom of humanity on full display and all of its inability to perceive and do right is made clear. Why, when we look at the stories about Jesus, we find not only were there people screaming crucify, but so many of the people that were following him all along weren't there in his dying hour. And what does that show us about our wisdom, about who we are? It shows us that we don't know right from wrong without help. The greatest human wisdom is revealed, the greatness of human wisdom is revealed as broken at the cross. We are the sort of people that will be chasing the light with pitchforks without God coming down and saying, hey, I want to help. Sin, dear friends, the word sin. I want you to wrap your mind around this. In the Greek, it's harmartia. And that doesn't simply mean doing wrong. It means missing the mark. As much as that word conveys doing wrong, it also means that something has gone wrong with us, that we cannot perceive what is right. Without the cross of Christ, we are in the dark. We don't even know who we were meant to be. For in the cross, we see first and foremost that we are meant to be recipients of grace from first to last. The cross proves, guess how bad your situation is. You can't save yourself. Guess how loved you are. God came to save the day. The cross in its wisdom reveals all of our stories hinge not on what we bring to the table in life, but on what God gives. And that's the cross, its clearest communication. God intends to give us grace upon grace. And at best, human rationality provides us but a piece of the map. It provides us even not a very important piece, after all. You have a compass that is broken. We all do. And all human wisdom, whether it's from Elon Musk or Albert Einstein, leaves us perishing. And also with a lot of superstition, if you know a little bit about those two men. The problem is we trust our intuition, our wisdom, more than we trust God. And the cross is grace to say, stop trusting your rationality and start learning to trust God's in every respect. So... In many ways, my my whole sermon is just simply saying to you, in 2022, make sure that you're pursuing the wisdom of God in the cross. Make sure that you're pursuing the wisdom and also the power of God. But let's focus on the wisdom. And I I want to talk a little bit about what that means in 2022 for us. Because I want to ask the question, what is the philosophy of our age in the city of Chicago, where you live? What's the philosophy of our day? You can say there are lots of different philosophies out there. We're kind of a syncretistic mishmash melting pot of all sorts of ideas. Uh, I want to go back to something I've been saying for a few years now that I think is the dominant ideology that we're all shaped by, we're all formed by. Some call it expressive individualism. I've called it the living in the age of the radical self. And the foundational belief, the foundational philosophy under which we've all been shaped is that we all have an inner sense of who we are, who we really are, And we mustn't let society, family, friends, spouses, and certainly not pastors, religions, or churches tell us to be anything different. No, this is who I am. And we are shaped by this mindset even if we don't live out its most radical uh, embodiments. Our commitment phobic, fear of missing out, always looking out for number one habits are a symptom of the disease that's uh, that's truly a, a, a pandemic, or what's the next word, uh, epidemic uh, in our society. We believe deep down, and without grace, we all believe this. We believe we define who we are, and we define who we get to be, and we're all shaped by this. The boundaries of body, place, community, and commitments are merely instrumental so long as they help us uh, achieve self actualization and happiness. And the wisdom of the cross says no. You can't know who you are on your own. You can't know who you are on your own. You don't have the tools to actually know who you were made to be. The cross must inform your view of self. Without the cross, you are completely lost in knowing who you are. You are all made by a specific God for specific purposes, and you have sinned and rejected him in specific ways and are specifically broken in particular fashion and have been re- have been helped by a specific Lord and Savior who died on a specific cross that you might live a specific way. And you cannot, cannot know who you're meant to be without that story. That folly, the folly today that we can be our own gods rejects the cross. And that is why people perish. Again, we're all shaped by this. I want to make sure you understand where I'm coming from. And of course, the strength, I mean, 
good, the best lies are good lies that have some truth in them. And of course, the strength of this age is that many of us know that I know myself better than any of you do and, and vice versa, right? You, you do. And there's an ownership of ourselves that's important in that. But at the same time, you can know yourself better than anyone else and not get very far in knowing yourself at all without the help of others. And I want to make sure that we understand it's the cross that shapes a community that helps us truly deeply know who we're meant to be. And I want to suggest, what do we do with that? What do we do with that? I, I, I believe, and I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with how to respond to this, because I want to actually see Agape do a better job of inviting Chicago to feast on the love of Jesus. And so what I suggest to you, in 2022, the wisdom of our age isn't going to be confounded or challenged primarily through a direct hit to the idea that living an isolated life isn't really going to make us happy. Because how many people have heard that so many different times? Many people have heard that, and this is absolutely true, but many are much more comfortable trying out the isolated life than going through the experience of hurt. And this age's wisdom also isn't going to be confounded by our rational arguments or our intellectual rhetoric on certain philosophical ideas. No, what will confound the wisdom of our age is the simple message that Jesus Christ died because of who we are, humans that have lost our way, and we need a Savior. And that sword doesn't just strike at our enemy's heart, it strikes at ours as well. For the only difference between perishing and being saved is believing that the cross shows us the truth about ourselves. It shows us we are those that feel that must feel that there's something deeply wrong about us uh, if we're going to perceive the truth, even though we have been made in the image of God. And no therapy, no breathing techniques, no retreat, no positive self-talk, or man-made religious habits, good as some of those things might be along the way, are going to actually cure our greatest ills. Now, I want to make sure that we as a church believe that there are people out there who realize they're broken in this way and will be receptive to a message that says, no, this is what God has done. You're not just broken. You're also given the opportunity to be redeemed by Christ at the cross. And they will see this as wisdom, even though many around us see it as folly as they are perishing. We are bought by a crucified God, nothing else. And this is the wisdom of God. But we're not just given the wisdom of God in this passage. We're also given the power of God. Reread 1 Corinthians 1, 18 with me, if you will. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, note the the distinction between wisdom for those who are perishing and power for those that believe. So the, the, there's a mixture of the ideas, which I think is interesting. But it's also interesting that this, again, focuses power on the cross. For many of us could readily agree that the resurrection is powerful. I mean, God defeated death of the resurrection. Yeah, that's powerful. But how is the cross powerful? What does the cross do in particular that's powerful? And I want to wrestle with that because that's what Paul says. We say, well, it's the cross connected to the resurrection. Well, yes, of course. You cannot detach the two. But there's something in particular about the cross that's powerful. And, of course, the cross, again, remains abject humiliation. It means shame. It means the giving away of oneself. It means being treated by like a loser. It means weakness. How is it strength? Part of the answer comes in understanding the contrast that is established. Paul will go on to say this about those who seek a certain type of power. Read 1 Corinthians 1, 22-23 with me. He says this, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. The contrast is clear here. Jews, Jewish people in Jesus' day would have been a people expecting their Messiah to do great things, to perform signs and wonders en route to routing the Roman Empire. You might say, well, Jesus did perform signs and wonders. He did do great things. I mean, he rose people from the dead and lots of other smaller things besides that. And yes, this is true, but this isn't the sort of sign that many of the Jewish people were after because many of these signs were meant to heal, not to brutalize an enemy. You see, when Jesus calmed the storm, it healed the anxiety of his friends. When he brought Lazarus back from the dead, he was giving hope to family and friends. It's not like placing his hand on the earth and causing a 
uh, earthquake that happened. It's not like killing 10,000 Roman soldiers with the word of his mouth, which he could do no problem. I mean, that's the sort of thing they were after. You know, I mean, that's what they wanted to see, not the, not the message of the cross. You see, many people in that day were looking for a king, warrior, messiah, not a suffering servant, Christ. At the cross, I want you to understand why this is such a stumbling block for many of Jesus' Jewish contemporaries. God chose not to deal with the felt problem, the problem they saw every single day, those Romans. They're getting in our way. What really mattered to Jesus and to God was dealing with our sin, death, and of course the devil. And that didn't do it for many of Jesus' contemporaries. As they saw the Romans trampling on them in their minds, they saw that power and they saw that as the power that must be dealt with. While God's power is focused on the evil powers behind all the flare-ups of evil in human history. You see, Jesus knew by taking on sin and through defeating sin, being death's power, and through being death's power, taking away also the authority of the devil to make us afraid, he was actually addressing what was really most at stake. To many Jewish people in that day, they certainly would have been around, and many of the people in Corinth, by the way, would have been Jewish for sure. Uh, They would have been a part of a people that expected the Messiah to win a victory. And so the cross was a massive stumbling block. For many Jewish folks in that day, they wanted a great leader. They wanted someone to resolve all the problems. And I want you to see the wisdom and the power of God in doing something very different. Let me just point it out to you in a very simple fashion. Uh, There are two emperors during Jesus' life. And the emperors are pretty much two of the most powerful people in the the history of the world. What are their names? Caesar Augustus and Tiberius. Caesar Augustus, many of you know his name because he's mentioned in the Christmas stories you just heard over and over again this last month. Tiberius, if you knew him, good job. Many people don't. And I'll tell you why they don't know him, because he's nobody right now. He's in the ground and he's gone away just like so many after him. And what that teaches us is that when we look at the powers of our day as the main problem, we're not seeing things like Jesus did. We're seeing it like many of the contemporaries and are seeing the cross in a way that's kind of like it's a stumbling block for us because we don't value the sin, the devil, and the death that Jesus defeated. We don't value his defeat over those things. And as believers, we celebrate the cross of Christ precisely because there the evil behind all the evil is defeated. It's the evil behind. That's where the that's where the power comes in. That's part of it. And to those being saved, there's more power, isn't there? You see, we look at the cross and we see the vice grip of sin that's around our nets, causing us to do that which we don't want to do. We know this reign here on earth has been has been uh, neutered and made temporary. The cross is the power to remind us over and over again when insulted, we don't need to retaliate. It has a power there. Look, he was insulted, he was mocked, and he was God. It has the power to take away that sword from us. It is the cross that shows us how far loving your neighbor can call us to go uh, for redemptive purposes. And I want to make sure we understand it again. Let us not mistake it. The cross did something. The cross actually defeated sin, death, and the devil. And if it didn't do something, it's a terrible example. There is no good in suffering if it doesn't accomplish something. But because of the cross, we know and can believe that sometimes our suffering has redemptive purposes. And there's power in that. There's power in that. And the cross is the power of God showing us once and for all, no matter what the world says about you, you can stand on solid footing. You don't have to live in darkness. And this is what we believe is the power of God to transform us. It's the power to defeat our great enemies, but it's also the power to give us hope and life and clarity. The cross humbles us. It always must. The greatest and the most powerful among us didn't seek the power of politics. He was no great political leader, and he had no formal office in his day. And the fact that he had no money shows that he didn't quite believe that money was power after all. No, he showed us a different type of power at the cross. A power used for building up and not for breaking down. But again, what has this to do with 2022 and us? Uh, Since I spoke about the larger cultural situation, let me talk about our church a little bit. Our Our little church that's going through Omicron again and all that goes with it or excuse me, with COVID and Omicron again. 
The power that we have to invite Chicago to feast of the love of Jesus starts first and foremost with a simple proclamation of the crucified Messiah and, and being proud of that message, even though it's met with shame. And let us resolve as a church to focus on preaching Christ and him crucified. But let me make an additional point that Paul makes here, especially in our own self-evaluation of us as a body and us as individuals. The cross has a lot to do with empowering your sense of self in a way that the world cannot. Read with me 1 Corinthians 1, 26-31. It says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Uh, let me put that in the Jeremiah sort of English paraphrase for you. Uh, you folks ain't all that. Uh, you're not that smart. Sorry, sorry. Um, this is just Paul. I'm just quoting Paul here. Uh, many didn't get into your preferred colleges, and those of you that got into whatever college you did were just average students after all. You aren't really that powerful, for after all, you just have a vote, just like about 200 million other people. You're not even really connected to the most important people of your day, unless you think that getting a 30% discount on Starbucks is really that important. And it really isn't, but that's still terribly expensive. And didn't, dear friends, having said all that brutal reality to you, didn't God take the shameful and lowly things of this world to shame, to shame the wise and the strong and the connected and the, and the intelligent? Didn't God give us wisdom through the nothingness of the cross, through the foolish death of the Son? And don't you know that the cross proves once and for all what the prophet Jeremiah said long ago, that don't, let, don't focus so much on your, your riches or your strength or your intellect, but focus on the fact that you know God. That's the thing you can boast in the most. And the cross gives you the ability to know that you know God and there's power in that. So church... Of, of a bunch of nobodies mm. in a neighborhood where the older woman doesn't even really value your vote as uh, she has shown by not letting us go to a place that we want to be those of you with little money and no respect I want to just tell you none of that really matters a whole lot if you see the wisdom of God the son of God died for you a little church that can't even control how you gather in the midst of different things I want to tell you that God knows your name he has written it in his book Church full of unimpressive people that wouldn't have many followers on Instagram or TikTok or anything like that. I want you to know that Jesus is doing way more than following you. He is leading you by name and saying, come follow me. And on the flip side of that, by the way, Jesus has had millions of followers before social media and will have billions of followers forever. And there's power to know that you're a part of what he is doing Knowing you don't have to perform mighty acts to be somebody in God's estimation in 22 gives you power. You don't have to be on the dean's list to be your papa's child. You don't have to tap into the latest fads and philosophies to have true and genuine insight into what really matters. No, what matters most, God has given you in Christ, especially at the cross. And you have been empowered to go live your life with confidence knowing who you are and who we are. So let's begin 2022 in this way. I can tell you all that you lack and how Jesus provides it, like the first gift I mentioned. But let me just show you and remind you, your power and wisdom is found at the cross. Let me take you to that cross, an emblem of suffering and shame, and say, here's your wisdom, here's your power. Hold tight to the cross in 2022, the wisdom and power of God. Many will come to you in 2022 telling you that you are either greater than you are, or that you must listen to yourself above, above all others, that you have to alone be God. And still others will tell you that you're a nobody, you're nothing, you, you're, you're less than spectacular. And the cross shows us that both are not quite the truth. Our, our perceptions are skewed beyond belief, but we are loved more than we could possibly imagine. And God doesn't want to leave us in the dark. So find truth and power in the cross for understanding yourself and understanding who we're going to be in 2022. 
<laughs> I want to make sure we understand this. Nothing but a bunch of people saved by the foolishness of God can understand the strength that is stronger than all human strength. And I want us to feel and experience that in 2022. Memorize that verse, 1 Corinthians 1.18, and hold it fast this year. Let's pray. God, I ask for wisdom. I ask for strength. I feel the, the depths of, uh, on January 2nd, uh, going through Omicron, I feel the depths of it being a nobody in many ways. Uh, but I also know that that gives me keen insight into the love of a master and where he's he's going. Uh, as a, one person has said, there is no pit so deep that Christ is not deeper still. And I pray that whatever we feel about ourselves, whether it's uh, too much self-esteem or too much self-exaltation or too little, I pray that we would recognize that in both those places, Christ wants to meet us and challenge us and lift us out of those pits. And I pray that we would perceive his wisdom and power to do so. I pray that you would help us this year to cling, cling to this verse, cling to this concept, this gift that we didn't know we needed at the cross, and to see its power in changing and shaping us. I pray that you would help us in that way. In the name of Christ, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jeremiah. A thoroughly unimpressive message that glorifies God. <laughs> now is the time for our offering. It's the time that we take the opportunity to give to the work of God by giving to the ministries of Agape Chicago. Uh, we, you can give online if you are online through our app. Uh, you can also give here at the facility. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9 6 remember this whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously that's not an arm twist because it goes on to say each of you should give what you decided to give in your heart not reluctantly or under compulsion because god loves a cheerful giver so please uh, take that to heart uh, take that to conscience and respond to the spirit accordingly. I give to you the music team. I was speaking with a friend um, last night and after reviewing the year, the holidays, um, just the, the funny things and the challenging things that happened over the holidays and the last year, because we we're both believers, we started talking about what we felt God was teaching us through that and what we could hold on to um, for this new year, talking about words of the year that we pick, verses of the year, um, just concepts of the year, and this idea of having tasted and seen that the Lord is good, having proved him over and over. We started thinking of the old song, Tis So Sweet, um, and the verse in Psalm 34 that says, those to look, those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed just really trusting and holding on to that promise. So I had one song picked for the end. Um, just wanted to sing that very first verse and chorus of Tis So Sweet to wrap our hearts, to wrap our minds around that, that um, as we enter the new year, that we have proved him over and over, and we will continue to do that. So sing with me.
Hey man, thank you for, for an impressive Got Your Fan music set. We really do appreciate it. Uh, stand up for your charge and blessing, please. The songwriter says, if we could reach beyond the wisdom of this age into the foolishness of God, that foolishness will save those who believe. Although their foolish hearts may break, they will find peace. Go in the name of the Father, the only wise God whose glory is revealed in Jesus Christ. Go in the name of the Son who on the cross became for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Go in the name of the Spirit who gives us wisdom and revelation so that we may know him better. Go in peace. You are dismissed.